In the history of jazz and popular music, there is one person that most people always go back to. One of the greatest soloists of all time, and one of the most innovative musicians of his day. He needs little more introduction. The man, the myth, the legend, Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong was born in New Orleans on August 4, 1901, in a rough, poor area known as Bacatown. His mother, Mary Ann, was only 15 years old when he was born, and his father, Willie Armstrong, abandoned the two of them shortly afterward. Mary Ann gave little Louis to Willie's mother, who lived in Storyville, the infamous red light district of Old New Orleans. It's safe to say that Armstrong's childhood was not stable. His father wasn't in the picture aside from a few short-lived reunions, and his mother was probably working as a prostitute. He had only one sibling, Lucy, who later went by the nickname Mama Lucy. And he grew up in a very sleazy area filled with brothels and gritty clubs with such names as Funky Butt Hall. Suffice it to say, he had to learn about life from pure experience. As a boy, he met a Jewish family named the Karnofskys, who he learned suffered from discrimination from both white and black people for being Jewish. This family ended up loaning him money, which he used to buy his first cornet. The trajectory of Lewis's life would change forever when he was arrested on December 31st, 1912, at the age of 11, for firing a blank from a gun he took from his mother's belongings during New Year's celebrations. This stunt put him into the Colored Waifs home for boys. This wasn't the first time he had been sent there. He and a couple of other local boys had also been picked up by police two years earlier for picking up scrap metal from a building that had burned down, intending to sell it for a bit of money. It was deemed stealing. The school was highly disciplined in military fashion, and it was here that he really was able to hone his skills on the cornet. He was a member of the brass band under the tutelage of a young man named Peter Davis, his first real music teacher. After leaving the school, he briefly lived with his father, though left because the man just wanted to use him for unpaid labor. Then he got a job hauling coal in the daytime, and another job at night playing his cornet at local dance halls. Storyville was forcibly shut down in 1917 in an attempt to put a stop to the rampant prostitution and other seedy goings on there, putting many local musicians, like Lewis, out of a job. Shortly afterward, Lewis met Joe King Oliver a jazz musician who was generally patient in dealing with younger musicians. He would be the next important person in Armstrong's musical career. On the day World War I ended, Lewis quit his coal job to pursue a full-time career in music. At age 18, he married Daisy Parker, an older prostitute. Their relationship was stormy to say the least. Among other things, he wanted her to quit her job, she already had another partner, and Lewis also cheated on her fairly early on in their relationship, and Daisy had a violent temper. Also coming along with them was a young boy named Clarence, the son of a dead relative. When he was three years old, Clarence fell from the second story of their apartment, and he was mentally handicapped thereafter, filling young Lewis Armstrong with immense guilt. Though he would provide for the boy all the way up until his own death decades later. Not long after setting out for a career in music, Armstrong got his first real break when he was offered to play in Fate Marable's band on a riverboat going up the Mississippi River in 1919. Here he would be part of a more disciplined band, and play alongside other jazzmen who would later become famous in their own right, such as Pops Foster and Warren Baby Dots. For this extended trip, Armstrong received $37.50 a week, as well as an additional $5 at the conclusion of the cruise. The music he played on this riverboat would probably not be considered jazz as we know it. They had to cater to the more respectable passengers, so pleasant dance music was the normal, though the band also threw in some rags here and there. Rags being ragtime music played with the band, an earlier form of jazz. This also may have been the time when Armstrong developed his distinctive gravelly voice as a result of a long-term cold. After the riverboat job finished, Armstrong joined the Tuxedo Brass Band, which had a very good reputation locally in New Orleans, and by 1921, Armstrong was recognized as a prominent local talent. He became so well-known, in fact, that Fletcher Henderson, who had one of the biggest bands in America, gave him an offer to play with his band in New York. Armstrong turned him down because he didn't want to leave his home, New Orleans. <laughs> 
There was only one man who could convince him otherwise. His idol, Joe King Oliver. Oliver also gave Lewis an offer to play with his band in Chicago in 1922, which he accepted. Oliver remembered Lewis from a few years earlier, and his playing had only improved since then. Armstrong wouldn't return to New Orleans until the next decade. The day after arriving in Chicago, Armstrong played his first show with King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band at Lincoln Gardens. During this performance, Oliver gave him the spotlight for a solo, and that's when Louis Armstrong, for the first time, showed a northern city what he could do. The next year, 1923, King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band would record 37 songs that would be released, making them among the first black jazz bands to be recorded, and the first black jazz band to produce a large body of recordings. But even something as safe-sounding as recording songs came with potential dangers and difficulties. Some of the recordings were made in Richmond, Indiana, a place that was rife with KKK activities. The band also couldn't find a hotel that would let them stay, so they had to go back to Chicago immediately. Unfortunately, these earlier recordings were made acoustically, so the full sound of the band wasn't really captured. The acoustic recording process couldn't reproduce the highs and lows very well on record, and the band sounded like they were playing inside of a tin can. During these recording sessions, the band had to improvise a bit by placing Armstrong much further back than the rest of the band because of how loudly he played. Around this time, Lewis met Lil Hardin, a pianist who joined the Creole Jazz Band, and the two quickly developed a liking for one another. However, there was the slight problem that both of them were already married, so arrangements were made for both of them to get divorces at the same time, and they married each other in 1924. Then there came a breaking point for the band. The exact details are not quite known due to differing accounts, but it was related to money, and all of the band members, except Lewis, blamed Oliver for the problem, and everyone quit except for Lewis and Lil. Lil also wanted to leave and get Lewis to achieve his full potential, something he could never do with Oliver. Oliver was the band leader, and while he knew that Armstrong, the pupil, had become better than him, the teacher, he would never concede his position at the top. Lil gave Lewis an ultimatum. It was either her or Joe. Perhaps surprisingly, considering his dedication to Oliver, Lewis chose her. Not long after his split with Oliver, he received another offer from Fletcher Henderson in New York, and this time, he accepted and moved to Harlem, where the emerging Harlem Renaissance was already getting underway. Lewis didn't really fit in with the other musicians in Henderson's band, many of whom were undisciplined and didn't seem interested in learning many new ideas from other jazz musicians. In 1925, Armstrong left the Henderson Band to play in his wife Lil's band at the Dreamland Cafe in Chicago. At his going away party, he got drunk and threw up all over Fletcher Henderson's tuxedo. Lil wanted to make Lewis famous as an individual. Before, the bands he was in all had the band leaders' names, but the individual musicians' names were not very well known publicly. Lil branded her husband as the world's greatest jazz cornetist. The shy and modest Armstrong didn't really approve of this, but he let it go on. He signed with Ralph Peer of OK Records. If you watched my video about country music in the 1920s, you might recognize Peer's name, and I said it correctly this time. Peer is the man who would also sign the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers in 1927. But before Hillbilly Records really became a big trend, he was also in the business of making race records, which were becoming quite a lucrative market. This began what many consider to be Louis Armstrong's greatest period. This was when he started recording small group jazz with Lil and a small number of other musicians, a period which lasted from late 1925 to early 1929. The first incarnation of Louis Armstrong and his Hot Five recorded for roughly a year from November 1925 to November 1926. One of the highlights of these recordings is Heebie Jeebies, which featured Armstrong scatting a verse. In a possibly fictional story, Armstrong dropped the paper containing the printed lyrics, so he improvised by scatting some nonsense syllables. Armstrong is sometimes credited with popularizing scatting with this record, though definitely didn't invent the technique as was sometimes believed long ago and Lewis himself absolutely never would have claimed that he did. A lesser known fact is that in 1926, Armstrong played with the orchestra at the Vendome Theater in Chicago that provided the musical accompaniment for silent films. 
While the film accompaniment was not really jazz, Erskine Tate, the bandleader, did encourage Armstrong to play jazzy pieces at times. Throughout his life, Armstrong appreciated a vast array of different genres, including classical, opera, and pop tunes, and his time at the Vendome really helped him to diversify his playing. And it was because of his time playing at the Vendome Theater that he switched from cornet to trumpet, because Tate wanted him to do so for the performances. This explanation for switching from cornet to trumpet was given by Lewis himself in a later interview, though there are other theories or further contributing factors that are still thrown around, including the simple explanation that, in the jazz world in general at that time, trumpets had overtaken cornets in popularity. Lewis and Lil's marriage was struggling. Lewis, already with a history of infidelity, began living with another woman and her family while he was still legally married to Lil. But it wasn't only that. Lil was very ambitious, and she pushed Lewis to do things he didn't necessarily want to do. He was only there to play music, and he was generally very passive about how he went about it on the business side of things. But could you really blame Lil for pushing him so much? Here was a man with a great talent who wasn't really achieving his full potential due in part to his modesty. It's not crazy to say that without Lil, Louis Armstrong might not have become as famous as he did. He quit Lil's band and accepted an offer from the pianist Earl Hines to play with his band. Lewis had almost reunited with Joe Oliver, but in the end decided against it. During this time, the recording industry was going through a big change, the introduction of the electric recording process. This made it possible to record a wider range of sounds and make them significantly clearer on record. In 1927, Armstrong returned to the studio with his Hot 5 musicians, with Lil replaced by Earl Hines on piano. But two more musicians were added, a drummer and a tuba player, who would sound much better on record now that electrically recorded songs were quickly becoming the norm. It was at this time that the Hot 7 made such influential recordings as Willie the Weeper, Weary Blues, and Potato Head Blues. Potato Head Blues was especially highly regarded by jazz musicians at the time, and Armstrong's final trumpet solo was far ahead of its time in terms of musical theory, though that kind of thing just came naturally to him rather than being meticulously composed. It was closely studied by contemporaries for the skill and technique that Armstrong used. Armstrong played with Earl Hines and others such as Zuddy Singleton at the Sunset Cafe in Chicago, though it was often shut down for alcohol violations during Prohibition. And amidst these closures, Armstrong, Hines, and Singleton had to search for gigs. Once, Armstrong and Singleton got a gig at Chicago's Savoy Ballroom without Hines, which damaged their relationship, though they continued to record together. The Hot 7 turned back into the Hot 5 again, and in 1928 they made perhaps their most influential recording of all and one which could certainly qualify as the most influential jazz song of the 1920s. That song was West End Blues. The recording's introduction featured a trumpet solo from Armstrong, followed by a mellow melody throughout the middle, then soft and gentle scatting from Armstrong, and a fantastic final trumpet solo from him. West End Blues had also been recorded by Joe Oliver only a few months earlier, but a quick comparison of the introduction will show how much hotter Armstrong's playing was. Although it should be noted that apparently Oliver didn't play the solos on his recording. And as an interesting little side note, 1928 was also the year that Armstrong began using marijuana regularly. It's not entirely clear how familiar he was with the drug previously, though we can probably assume he at least knew about it for a pretty long time considering where he grew up in New Orleans. The next year, as the Savoy Ballroom in Chicago was struggling to stay open and wasn't paying the musicians on time, Armstrong moved back to New York and worked with Louise Russell, and made some rare racially mixed recordings with skilled white jazzmen like Jack Teagarden, Eddie Condon, and Eddie Lang. 1929 also saw a big change in Armstrong's career. He would switch to a large big band and start to play more popular songs. And then there came another opportunity that would launch him more into the mainstream, rather than just being famous among jazz musicians. Up to this point, while his recordings were extremely influential among other jazz musicians, most average people still weren't too familiar with Louis Armstrong's name or music, at least outside of the few cities he played in. And there were two necessary factors in successfully reaching a mainstream audience at that time. White people and pop songs. <laughs> 
After one unsuccessful stint at a review show, he was in another review on Broadway called Hot Chocolates, which was co-written by a rising musician and songwriter, Fats Waller. In Hot Chocolates, Armstrong sang Ain't Misbehavin', which proved to be wildly successful in New York. And with that, mainstream white audiences were introduced to perhaps the greatest musician of that generation. And now, Louis Armstrong had his foot in the door to a truly mainstream audience, and this would be his first step to national and international stardom. The success of his appearance in Hot Chocolates and his popular featured song motivated Armstrong to record almost exclusively popular songs throughout the rest of 1929. But that's not to say that there weren't jazz elements to them, as well as generous helpings of trumpet solos. These recordings were, however, watered down with pop melodies enough that they could be distributed to the white parts of town. But not only was his overall popularity increasing rapidly, he was becoming known as an influential vocalist, not just a jazz instrumentalist. This is especially interesting considering how gravelly and rough his voice sounded. Looking back, it might be surprising that Armstrong found any success as a singer at that time, so I think it's really important to talk about this aspect of Louis Armstrong at least a little bit. While his vocal range was fairly limited, he was full of techniques, one of which, scatting, I mentioned before. But his phrasing proved very influential as well, and was perhaps his biggest influence on future jazz vocalists. Vocal phrasing is a kind of vague term meaning how a vocalist uses rhythm, spacing, and melody when singing. When you imagine a singer, you immediately think of someone singing a melody straight into the point. But Armstrong, as well as some other jazz vocalists at that time, jazzed up the vocal melody over the straight background melody. Maybe the most well-known example of Armstrong using this technique is his later recording All of Me from 1932. Armstrong's phrasing would influence countless other singers in the following years, most prominent of them probably being Bing Crosby, who never hesitated to express his admiration for Armstrong. And of course, Armstrong's voice was also very distinctive. It's one of those voices that people can immediately match with the person because no one else sounded like that. This was important for branding, though like I said before, this wasn't really something that he actively pursued. Not to mention his very personable and casual stage presence, and use of hip jive long before the bebop hipsters 20 years into the future. And this is where Louis Armstrong closed the 1920s, as a rising star in popular music and culture, but already a jazz legend. But, as most of you probably already know, that was just the beginning, and he would continue to be an influential and well-known figure even decades later. Despite some of his personal flaws, such as his constant infidelity, he seemed like a really cool guy to jam with, always eager to entertain and talk music with a jiving flair, a modest man with a great talent. Personally, for me, he is high up on the list of 1920s people I would like to hang out with. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new about a man who virtually everyone seems to know in some way. I've been holding off on covering Louis Armstrong for a long time because what hasn't there been said of him already? And there also weren't that many photos of him from the 1920s, so sorry if that was a bit lacking. I just wanted to synthesize all the important information and hopefully it was easy to follow. And a quick note on photo sources. These two 1929 photos I used toward the end of the video were courtesy of the Louis Armstrong House Museum, so check them out if you want. Well, that's all for now all you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for more tales from the jazz age.